Hi everyone, uh, my name is Glenn Deason and I'm joined today by Alexander McCurris and Professor Richard Sakwa. Um, so Professor Sakwa is a retired uh, emeritus professor of uh, Russian and European politics at University of Kent. Uh, I would say the greatest Russian scholar we have in Europe, uh, an author of uh, 18 plus books and uh, citing his work has become near obligatory now for any serious Russian scholar. Uh, so yeah, welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Very uh, and a pleasure to be back. Yes. So uh, the yeah the reason why we have Professor Sakwar today is to discuss uh, a book he had coming out uh, last year, which is uh, the Lost Peace: uh, How the West Failed to Prevent uh, um, a Second Cold War. So uh, yeah, you'll have the chance to correct me, of course, but the way I understand it, the foundational argument would be effectively we've been attempting to navigate between two orders. This is where the uh, loss of the peace uh, began. So I guess after the Cold War in the West, we already lived in two worlds. We had the internal order of the political West organized under US hegemony, and then we had more or less the external order under the UN Charter. Um, based more on sovereign equality, one could argue the more Westphalian model. And the challenge, of course, after the Cold War, uh, and then two years later when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was two possible systems uh, uh, on the menu. So on one hand, we had the opportunity to either expand the internal order, uh, that is to make the Atlanticist order uh, effectively the new world order, that is uh, hegemony, um, uh, under the United States and the liberal ideals, or we could form a more of an inclusive uh, yeah, sovereign system uh, based more around the UN Charter, that of 1945. Now, uh, obviously, towards the end of the Cold War, we had this conflict. Uh, Gorbachev wanted this common European home, which very much resembles this uh, sovereignty-based uh, internationalism. Uh, and then on the other side, you had the US calling for a Europe, Poland free, uh, which is more organized around US hegemony and sovereign inequality. Uh, so obviously we ended up with um, the, the American order uh, in which uh, you write in the book, the inside order became the outside order, uh, if I understood it correctly. And uh, uh, effectively, yeah, hegemonic peace plus uh, liberal universalism to mitigate uh, the anarchy of the international system. And this is what NATO expansion was also intended to facilitate. Now, obviously, the issue of Russia, I guess, how would you, how does Russia, this former adversary, fit into the hegemonic order? How is Europe organized? Uh, I guess the dilemma is always on the inside, it's too big, dilutes hegemony. On the outside, it will be an uh, adversarial pole. And uh, the threat then would be that we would revive the Cold War, much like Kennan warned, uh, warned against. And... Um, Again, this was widely recognized by both advocates and opponents of enlarging NATO. Now, uh, well, one could argue that the solution to this hegemonic system was uh, if Russia would just remain weak, and Russia was weak, it was getting weaker by the day, then it could remain outside, and it wouldn't really matter that much. Uh, it could be facilitated orbiting the West, if you will. Um, but again, as we've uh, learned from people like uh, William Perry, the US uh, Secretary of Defense under Clinton, uh, everyone kind of knew that keeping Russia on the outside would re revive the Cold War logic, if you will. Uh, but again, he was weak, so then it would matter. Who cares? So it went from being this evil empire to an insignificant country. And uh, I guess what happened was, as also Kennan predicted, was Russia got stronger, much like China, and it couldn't really be accommodated by this hegemonic system, which was premised on Russia's perpetual weakness. So uh, I guess this is where we lost the peace. But um, please, uh, if, if, if you could uh, um, yeah, maybe outline the, the, the premise of your book. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I think that you've done a marvelous job in doing so. So <laughs> that really does uh, um, get to the core of it. But I'll make three points to, to add to that. Uh, the first one is that, uh, you know, underlying it, if you like, the meta politics or the meta idea behind this book uh, is, and indeed, uh, uh, to understand the politics of our times, is the idea that there is an alternative. That, in other words, outside of this political West and outside of our own little world, there's alternatives. I mean, we're not just talking about that put forwards by the post-colonial global South and so on which is important, but even 
across the world that there is an alternative to this very, um, I mean, unrealist, but uh, that sort of stark realism that considers uh, international politics is only about great power conflict, about one trying to get it faster and over the other, and about endlessly, um, you know, hopefully managing conflict, which we're doing very badly at the moment, even worse than we did in the first Cold War. But in short, that a better world is possible and that it's worth for peace movements, for all those women and men of goodwill to fight for it. And uh, that's, I suppose, the deep underlying thing. And people like Gorbachev, though, with a complex history, who accepted this and grasped that that sense. So that, I suppose, is the first uh, meta-political point. The second one is that uh, the way you formulated it is is exactly, um, exactly what I was saying. But I've slightly, uh, you know, built on that to... Uh, my thinking at the moment is to draw a contrast between empire and commonwealth. So that uh, internal system is empire. And of course, the world knows that there's two ways politics, international politics can be organized, is you know, uh, either empire or endless competitive international politics, so great power politics, geopolitics even. So, But the idea of this empire uh, is that you know, it, it, you know, after you know, after 1989, even you could say, in the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we got to uh, what you could even call it hyper imperialism, and obviously that refers back to Karl Kautsky and those big debates before the First World War. Interestingly enough, about uh, hyper imperialism, uh, he meant it in terms of colonialism, and indeed. Financial capital, of course, this was the age of Hobson, Hilferding, and of course, Lenin's contribution to that debate. But the key point is that empire is this model of universalism and this, it's, you know, empire's got many good things to say for it because it undermines sort of ethnic tensions and it's supranational and so on. You could say the EU is a type of empire as well. Uh, but on the other side, this other order we could call commonwealth. Yes, it's inspired by uh, the United Nations and it's uh, those, and of course, the United Nations, that charter international system, which we live under today, though it's under unprecedented attack, this is a UN based system. This charter system is based on, uh, you know, these visions of Commonwealth, global Commonwealth, and a different type of politics to empire. It's based on sovereign internationalism. You talked about that. Sovereignty but tempered by an internationalism and a commitment to those charter principles, human rights, and all the rest. So that's the second thing. The third thing is this notion of a political West. This is, you know, that empire. What is this empire? It's a political West. It's a system, power system. You know, you remember that communist Eisenhower in his farewell address? <laughs> talked about the military industrial co complex and its dangers uh, and uh, so many others have talked about it uh, um, Hans Morgenthau referred to it by the way way back when it was being established late 1940s early 50s this is the Trumanite state as others call it a military industrial complex revolving door with Congress and so on so uh, this uh, Trumanite state this political west was established during the Cold War and after the Cold War uh, it you know expanded in the way we've just suggested, became hyper, uh, and of course with its epigones, epigones uh, like Victoria Newland, who's just retired, but you know her whole career was devoted to expanding and viciously, aggressively, dominatingly uh, that that system. Uh, but uh, so that political West. Can I just say though? I also add, there is a better West. Of course, uh, Russians all the way back from Peter the Great have always suggested this, that Russia, they would, of course, claim that they are the better West, no, no more, but uh, in the old days. But there's another West. There's a civilizational West where for 500 years has dominated because of its military power. That political, that civilizational West is on the way. It is changing. It's evolving. And just to say the third West, a deep West, this cultural West, is not just Greco-Roman or Judeo-Christian. It's a, a cultural West which was established you know, in interaction with Assyrian, Persia, indo sinic civilizations. And so in other words, when we say anti-Western, we sim or the West, we really do need to be clear what we're talking about. And what I'm talking about is the political West. Thanks very much. Uh, 
if I could just say a few things, I mean, you've anticipated some of the points I was going to ask you about in connection with the book. But can I just say a few things? I was reading the book, and the first point is about alternatives. The fact that there were alternatives and that there were choices. And reading the book through, I have to say at many, many points, I felt very sad. Because um, I absolutely do agree that there was a lost peace after 1989. And the reason it happened was, you know, you got perhaps an overabundance of political imagination on the one side, and the Russian side, Gorbachev and all his ideas, but also a very a failure, ultimately, of matching political imagination to a great extent on the Western side. And there was a point you made quite early on in the book, which I actually remember from the 1980s. I mean, I remember it at the time, which is that many people in the United States, in powerful positions in the United States, saw what Gorbachev was proposing as an opportunity, yes, but an opportunity for American power to be increased but they also saw it as a threat. <laughs> they were afraid of these changes that Gorbachev was proposing. They were worried that, you know, it would make uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, attractive to people in Europe, that it would result ultimately in an erosion of American power. And so at a very early stage, even, you know, at a very early stage during the program that Gorbachev was putting forward, there was already a big pushback against it from the United States and within Washington. Uh, Reagan was very receptive to Gorbachev's ideas. People in the Bush, the, sub, the succeeding Bush administration, to a certain extent, less so. But there was a, a, a sense that we can't really go where Gorbachev wants us to go, because if we do, then that will somehow result in a reduction in our own power. What he's asking us to do is something that we don't want. To, we don't want to do. So I, I, I felt that that was there, and I think that was there from the outset. And in the end, it explained an awful lot. It explained why there was never really possibility that the United States, the, the people in charge at that time, would of themselves have made the kind of choices to consolidate the peace that they did. The option to, to do it was there, but they didn't They didn't want to seize it. And the second thing is, what you say about the United Nations system, and it brought home to me something about the United States Nations system, which is how different it is ultimately from every other system that has existed in terms of an attempt to organize international relations. Mm -hmm. Firstly, it is global. It, it encompasses, I think, every state. Secondly, it offers everybody around the world a voice. There's the General Assembly, there is the voice there. Thirdly, it does extend talk about values um, in terms of the, the Charter has values, there's the, you know, the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, all those kind of things. So that is there too. It sets up a framework for global cooperation within an international global system. And at the same time, it acknowledges um, a point which Glenn has been discussing a lot recently, which is that there has to be, that the, the needs to be a concert of powers at the center. And this is a mechanism which was intentionally created after the Second World War to avoid and get over the crises of the Second World War, which were European crises, ultimately, but which people globally bought into. Everybody you know, around the world, there is massive support for it. And um, it, it actually does provide, if you go back to it, a way forward. And if you use it in the way perhaps 
in a way that is close to the way that it was originally envisaged. And that not only has not been done, but as you said just now, um, it is under attack to a degree that we have never seen before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, in, absolutely, I agree completely. Um, first, I just say that you're yeah, absolutely right. It makes me sad as well that there was an opportunity, there was a piece to be lost, or potential piece to be lost, uh, a positive peace order of the sort we've outlined just now, uh, a positive peace order based on United Nations principles, which really are, you know, principles which, you know, didn't come out, weren't accidental. First of all, they came out from the understanding that the Second World War was the most catastrophic war humanity has ever had, and then, of course, overshadowed by nuclear uh, weapons. So we really must do better in future. And this international system is based on that. And, of course, it's evolved over the years. Unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, as you say, the Security Council is a type of concert of powers, in a mini concert of powers, but it no longer reflects the, uh, you know, we're, obviously we're talking about, in particular, India and Brazil, representation from Africa and some other issues uh, involved with it. But nevertheless, it's the best we can do. And when the those people who devised the United Nations in the early 40s they had these ideas. They were learning from the failure of the Versailles system, learning from that old concert of powers, then the 19th century one, the Congress of Vienna system, which ended up in such catastrophe in 1914. Uh, so they were learning. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not saying this is the best thing in, ever. That it can evolve, it can change, but it has to be organic. Uh, whereas already we know that uh, Ukrainians are saying that the United Nations doesn't work, and they're talking about being expelled from United Nations, from the Security Council, absolutely crazy stuff. Um, but no one dared to say that sort of stuff in the first world, first Cold War, and they're saying it now. That's why it's more dangerous. So as you say, we, we lost, uh, we, we, we squandered that opportunity for a positive peace order. We glimpsed it in the first Iraq war when the Soviet Union endorsed and worked with the United States and other powers uh, over Iraq and Ku Kuwait issue. But it was there. Um, in, in, you know, as you say, we squandered it uh, and we squandered it and that takes us indeed. Why? Uh, and why? You're absolutely right. Right from the beginning, and there we need to be careful about, well, I mean, we, I do, we all need to be careful uh, or we all have to sort of define what we mean. And uh, if, you know, to continue this Commonwealth versus Empire analogy, uh, that Commonwealth is based on, you know, uh, in a Commonwealth, the United States would exercise, a, you know, leadership. And we don't mind. I mean, uh, Gorbachev and Putin have said it. The US is the world's most powerful economy and, uh, you know, possibly in military terms as well. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we expect it to exercise leadership, but that leadership, which it sometimes showed in the first Cold War, not always, but it, uh, you know, it's leadership. But leadership then leads to a type of politics which we could call hegemony. That is the 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 um, active or sort of the voluntary acquiescence in that leadership. And when the United States is at its best, that's you know, it's there. You know, uh, unfortunately, you know, European Union on some issues perhaps has shown a sort of benign hegemony, but unfortunately, it's lost its way quite catastrophically. Um, but on the the other type of politics is, you know, that empire one, which then is based not on not on hegemony, not on you know, voluntary the world going along with it. It's based on dominion, and it's based on coercion. And it's based on domination. And of course, it's based on exclusion. And that takes us to the to Russia, of course, and to China um, coming up. So that it cannot think, this political West cannot envisage something outside of itself, which is legitimate. That anything outside of itself is either has to be subordinated as an ally. And of course, there's huge activity to try to get India on board today and to build up this global block politics, Cold War style, you know, NATO plus uh, plus, which, you know, brilliant success of NATO in Europe just led to the worst war since 1945. So let's try that brilliant success in the rest of the world so we can spark wars all across East Asia, South China Sea, etc. Uh, but uh, you know, that, that um, so, so that is that, uh, that, you know, expansive political and cannot envisage something outside of itself yet today. The global South, the global majority, or as Kyrgyzstan, of course, the world majority, 
aren't having it. They're saying, look, enough is enough. And uh, you're quite right to say, this is a European war going on. What They say, you know, India and all, Indonesia and other countries, Brazil, South Africa in particular, many, many others. They look, this has nothing to do with us. And this time, you're not going to drag us into it like you did in the First World War and the Second World War. So the world has moved on. And of course, what this war has done, the Russo-Ukrainian war has shown, is the marginalization and indeed the intellectual and political bankruptcy of the political West. Though, as I say, we can recover something, hopefully, for a better cultural mm -hmm. West uh, and a better West. And that, you know, if we have this model, we can say, look, we can do better. And, you know, when I mentioned earlier that list peaceniks, of course, the churches is something very important in all of this. I don't just mean the World Council of Churches, which was important in the First Cold War, but so many other, you know, genuine civil society organizations, uh, you know, are they all talk about it every Sunday, every Friday in the mosque and many other places. They're saying, look, we've got to do better. I, I like what you both said about the political imagination, because this was also <clears throat> something that Gorbachev touched on uh, towards the towards the end, in which he he he, he effectively yeah, cautioned uh, the Americans that you know both uh, Moscow and Washington had to be prepared for what uh, what the end of the Cold War would mean, because uh, the entire power structures that had been premised on on perpetual conflict. So this is why. Uh, this is why, yeah, the, the the two blocks effectively had loyalty towards uh, either Moscow or Washington. So, saying that, uh, yeah, we need the political imagination to uh, be willing to effectively walk a little bit away from empire in order to, um, yeah, to 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 get an end to the Cold War. But uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that's why the, your book is interesting as well because when you talk about alternatives, this would be effectively the the. Um, the political imaginations, even though, as you mentioned, a lot of this would be based on previous uh, lessons from history, because again, the, from the Congress of Vienna, the main lesson we effectively had was after the French had been defeated uh, in 1815, they got another seat at the table, uh, simply because uh, this is what would bring stability. And then, of course, uh, doing the opposite in after the First World War uh, with the Treaty of Versailles, in which uh, uh, the Germans were effectively meant to be kept perpetually weak, uh, this will be the source of peace. And it, yeah, so it seems that uh, the, yeah, the peace effectively we chose was, uh, which many Russian scholars have pointed out as well, uh, such as Karagno, saying that uh, we try to impose another uh, treaty of Versailles, so uh, perpetuating the weakness of Russia, if you will. But, um, uh, but, uh, but I was curious about the, how, how would the alternatives be, though, in terms of balancing uh, political realities with ideal, um, idealism? Because I think a, a key challenge of these two systems, which you refer to, uh, I th in my opinion, they already popped up uh, right after the Cold War in the Charter of Paris for a New Europe in 1990. You know, you have kind of had this dilemma. All, all states should have the freedom to join whatever security arrangements they want. Uh, there should be no, you know, no one state should tell another what to do. And on the other hand, we said, also, we have to have indivisible security, no dividing lines. So, uh, for example, in the context of NATO expansion, this meant, you know, NATO should not expand because then you're redividing Europe. You are now promoting security of one country at the expense of another. And, um, uh, but, but at the same time, we're saying anyone should be allowed to join any military bloc they want. Um, uh, how how would it be possible to escape uh, such a dilemma? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, a couple of points there. Uh, uh, in the book and uh, in general, I distinguish between the international system, which is the uh, today I call it the Charter International System, you know, building on the, the Versailles system, which failed, as you say, the uh, Congress of Vienna system, the Utrecht system, and the Westphalian systems before. These are all European based, by the way, um, rather than though they've gone global now. So but this is the international system based on sovereign internationalism, based on ideas of Commonwealth, based on ideas of uh, you know, of multilateralism, but uh, but sovereignty. Then we have at the second level, although I don't, it's not particularly hierarchical. We have international politics, 
And it is in international politics that we have these block politics. We have the you know, state states compete and so on. And some states refuse to compete, the non-aligned movement and so on. Just for the sake of completeness, I also say there's a third level, which is the uh, global international political economy, which we don't talk about much. Well, you do, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't so much. And uh, then the fourth level is transnational uh, you know, civil society. This is, as I said, churches, peace movements, and many other good things and some bad things as well. Uh, but uh, in terms of international politics, as you say, uh, this is why uh, it looked as if in after the end of the first Cold War, 1989-91, it looked as if we were going to get finally, in terms of those documents you've mentioned, of course, going all the way back to the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, that we were going to see a congruence, a merger between the way that international politics is conducted and those principles of the charter international system. That we were going to see a convergence uh, of uh, based on those charter principles. That is the basis of the of that, you know, the positive peace order. We were going to see a convergence. Unfortunately, we saw the exact opposite. We we actually saw that one suborder within international politics, the 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 political West or the so-called rules-based order or the liberal international order, this one began to instead of having this convergence, it usurped and claimed the privileges of the Charter International System, which of course meant the subversion of international law and making up the law as you go along. We're talking about the bombing of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in 1999, Iraq in 2003, Libya 2011, and so much more. Uh, so instead of a convergence, we saw a massive, well, not just even a divergence, an attempt to privatize the Charter International System in keeping with the dominant ideas of neoliberalism in the post-Cold War years. So we saw the exact opposite. So, so instead of these principles, which you outline of indivisible security uh, being guaranteed, uh, we, we got the exact opposite. It was used as an instrument. It was used instrumentally rather than working autonomously. And of course, rules-based order and all the rest is, you know, by definition then, it then exercises double standards because double standards, it becomes systemic. It's not an accident. It was not an accident today that the Western powers, the political West, is endorsing, uh, and indeed, well, not in well, in military terms, supporting what uh, Israel is doing in Gaza today. You know, one of the most monstrous things. We don't need to call it a genocide, but we call it, you know, a killing which is way disproportional to the uh, to the cause, which was dreadful, of course, the events of seventh of October last year. But you know, that double standards, and of course the. The, the cheerful bombing of Yemen for seven years after 2014-15, uh, you know, but US and UK. The, and of course, while talking about human rights uh, and such like, it's, it almost makes one despair, the fact that this gulf, but it's systemic. It's not just, you know, a bad leader and so on. It's going to be the case because you have this gulf between the international system and international politics, and we've got this suborder claiming to be the international system uh, and to also claiming dominance in within international politics to the exclusion of all the others. Just one other point on NATO enlargement. Uh, in some ways, you know, that the actual NATO enlargement, however much it may have been a repudiation of the promises given to Gorbachev in 1990, it still ultimately, it was the way it was done. And, you know, both, uh, you know, that great man, Zbigniew Fuzinski in 1997 in his book, uh, Grand Chessboard, uh, and William Burns, head of CIA today, and others said, OK, enlarge if you like, but you've got to have an overarching security deal with Moscow. So there's got to be done. And then within that, NATO could enlarge. And, you know, there could be some good things about it. Stops Greece and Turkey going to war, stops the small states uh, uh, going, repeating the experience of the 1930s when they were all going, uh, fighting, not so much at war, but certainly attacking each other. So, but it was but that absence was completely. And this is where that lack of imagination, accompanied by the amazing lack of institutional innovation at the end of the Cold War. This was one of the major geopolitical uh, turning points of our time, and absolutely nothing new came out of it. No, no new institutions, no new ideas, and no new political imaginary. You know, many of us put forward these ideas, not new, but, you know, this Francois Mitterrand talked about a confederation of Europe. I certainly remain very strongly 
of, I, I sometimes joke, I'm the last Gaullist in England. Uh, they did point out that there was one other whose name I've now forgotten. But uh, but uh, the, uh, there's a very few. But by Gaullist, I mean, uh, you know, a pan-continental vision of from Lisbon to Vladivostok, all that talk we used to have. And that was what we really did need. Uh, you know, Bismarck used to say, you know, the secret of uh, international politics is a good treaty with Moscow. And that was lacking after lacking that year. Which which is astonishing in some ways, because even if you looked at the situation in Russia in the 1990s, which is chaotic, disorderly, all the things we all know. And I went there and I think we all did. We've all probably been to Russia in the 90s. We remember what it was like. But it was still potentially the biggest, well, it was the biggest, it was potentially the most powerful country in Europe. One would have thought that the priority that should have been given was precisely to working out that good treaty with Moscow. And when, when one talks about a good treaty, one doesn't mean a treaty that favours lopsidedly one side at the expense of the other. It means a treaty that is actually going to last, not a Versailles-type treaty, but a Vienna-type treaty. And um, I can remember lots of people saying it. I can remember, you know, was it Bush who said, you know, if we don't make them a friend, we could end up finding them an enemy all over again. And yet it wasn't done. Mm. Priority was instead given to all kinds of other things, you know, extending NATO eastwards, um, satisfying concerns in places like, you know, Warsaw and Riga. And I'd say those concerns should be ignored. But... Moscow was the first place to begin. And can I just also add to that, to the extent that there was an attempt to work with the Russians, it was an attempt to work with the Russians by manipulating them. <laughs> we were massively over-involved in their internal affairs in a way that I don't think many people today would want to defend. Uh, the notable example of that is the 1996 election when U.S. Uh, political consultants and money came in to support the re-election of Yeltsin, uh, and including media manipulation, political manipulations of all sorts. And of course, many people argue that was when Russian democracy maybe didn't die, but certainly it was wounded, and it certainly hasn't uh, properly recovered ever since. And that was in the 1990s, before Putin was in power. So, yeah, absolutely right. This intervention, this engagement, quite apart from the economic level, and the uh, development, um, the, the you know, as Kirkur Yavlinsky endlessly says, you know, the neoliberal, the uh, model of uh, of economic transformation was was catastrophic and it still has a huge legacy to this day of course it's used for political capital purposes but it was also genuine as you say we all know russia of the 1990s when you saw uh you know babushka this uh, ladies selling family heirlooms military medals of their husbands or fathers from the wartime just just to buy a kilo of potatoes it was so sad and this is one reason which inspires people today uh, you know, in a complex way, but in general, to support you know some of the achievements of the Putin system, which I think shouldn't we we often forget about its achievements. We can talk about its failings as well, of course, which they were there. But uh, you know, its achievements uh, shouldn't be forgotten. I think that uh, a lot of the political imaginations should have been directed towards um, harmonizing, I guess, this idealism with the political realities, because. Uh, uh, as, as you began to say when you uh, when you talked about your book, was this idea of universalism that it's quite challenging because often when we come with uh, these ideas of liberal democracy, human rights, that it's uh, this kind of universalism is uh, only only a positive thing. I I, I like to go, you know, always use the example of uh, uh, Socrates uh, saying, you know, I'm a citizen of the world. It's uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. We're all part of the same club, but then of course. When you have Alexander the Great, he also says more or less, "I'm citizen of the world." But he used that to then build an empire because it, it diminishes. So, well, the universal claims will diminish the principle of sovereignty, and I guess this is the difficult thing when you develop an international system. How do you unify around uh, universal ideals while still preserving uh, the, the, yeah, the principle of sovereignty? So this uh, again, this goes right at the core of world order, and. Um, I think we've seen this before. Uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, well, I often brought up bring up the example of the French Revolution, for example, because this was also based on a lot of the same principles, and uh, you know, it was supposed to create a brotherhood of nations, and instead it ended up with an uh, with an uh, uh, emperor and uh, yeah, and, uh, and an empire. So, uh, so how was it turned on the heads? And you can say the same with the Bolsheviks, also were idealist and internationalist, uh, but also not intending to have uh, yeah real foreign policy, but then also developing an empire. It seems uh, we kind of walked into this uh, same minefield with uh, the idea of a liberal liberal hegemony, in which we have this uh, you know uh, one can say yeah good values which uh, well intentioned. Uh, however, at the same time, we see how they manifest themselves. Uh, as, as you said, we keep talking about human rights uh, while you know committing this uh, slaughters from yeah, Yemen to to now Gaza. So it's um, uh, this in this political imagination, we we don't we haven't seemed to really explore this sufficiently in terms of uh, how uh, yeah, like Napoleon, you, you go from you know advancing these ideals to ending up with an emperor. Yeah, it, it, it's underlying this um, is the sense uh, we used to have a sense that history has a certain linearity to it that we can. Uh, well, I mean, what you're alluding to is the fact that history just is this endless cycle of good intentions leading to unintended bad consequences. And you're absolutely right that uh, history is uh, is rather than this uh, linear version of onwards and upwards. It's been endlessly going around in circles of the sort of, you know, what René Guénon and uh, uh, Oswald Spengler and Arnold Toynbee uh, at the beginning of the last century were going on and on about. It's all cycles, empires rise and fall, and it's all the same sort of thing. In other words, that myth of Sisyphus is the one that works best. You know, you're endlessly rolling that boulder up the hill and it keeps coming down, quite often crushing the people, uh, but pushing it up the hill. However, that I, I couldn't stop there. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's why I argue precisely and why you know, I say an alternative politics is possible. You know, we used to couch it in the language of socialism, as you've alluded to, Leninist or Marxist or whatever. And indeed, I think that's still got a valid uh, you know, input into this. Uh, but or we could couch it in the language of, you know, good old fashioned conservatism, Burkean conservatism, sense of community, which I think is important contribution to all of this. Mm -hmm. But what the bottom line I'm trying to say is that if we can, you know, package this, if you like, in the language of marketing, in terms of commonwealth, that to say, look, we're in the nuclear age, that humanity faces a global climate crisis uh, of unprecedented character, and many other things that, you know, we also have a technological development in our times, which is just so phenomenal, you know, just in this little laptop I'm looking at now, is, you know, it was almost unthinkable 20 years ago, what its computing power in short, the, the gulf between the aspirations for a type of commonwealth or community or the, the common good, you know, there's a, the, our blue labor colleagues have a good language to describe this uh, on the one side, and this endless, uh, you know, which is now increasingly suicidal politics of, of political West, of, of empire. We, we see it in a completely avoidable, pointless, catastrophic, disastrous war in Ukraine to this day, uh, of course, which could well be repeated over in uh, the Far East. Uh, yeah. So what is, you know, what is the language of this alternative? I, as I said, the United Nations system has matured. The states, there's now 193 states in the United Nations, about 200 states in the world. They have matured. The post-colonial world, that 500 years of history, which you are just trying to put, make your comment in, you know, that cycle of 500 years is coming to an end. The European phase of global history is coming to an end. Uh, and the, the Atlantic phase. And we're now getting, you know, the people use the language multipolarity, uh, which is a rather thin Book to put it on, but yet, yes, it's multipolarity, multi-order world. Some people talk about Acharya talk about uh, multiplex world. So we've got the key idea is pluralism. You know, then you could couch it in language of civilizational states. You've got the China civilizational state, the Indo one, uh, the Russo, the Orthodox one, in one way or another, uh, and of course the uh, 
well, the political West one. So, uh, you know, there's there's this um, idea that, you know, multi-polarity, multi-order world within the framework of the international system. But that requires one thing, and that is a simple thing, but impossible to achieve, and that is modesty in the political West. That requires a United States that returns to becoming a normal great power. And this is what... Uh, what is her name uh, under Reagan? Um, she, she, uh, her, right. It, no, no, the other one, the one who was his representative to the United Nations. Samantha Power. Uh, no, well, before that. Well, yeah, but I just said okay. that, you know, there was a whole stack of stuff at the end of the Cold War, first Cold War, mm -hmm. which said the United States must become a normal great power. Then you got the, all the neocons of the Newland sort, Kagan sort, who said, no way. If we become a normal great power, the world will go to hell in a basket, in a handcart. Um, and of course, it's now gone to hell uh, with our US UK um, interference and endless militarism and so on. And of course, this. Now we're in a stage where, you know, military budgets going up, but, you know, the world is arming people talking of a pre-war situation that makes, you know, I think discussions of the sort we're having now even more important to say, no, this isn't necessary. You know, that, that Russia, we've just started talking about it. Let's evaluate. What is its real goals? Is, the, is Russia a new emanation of Nazi Germany? In other words, that vision that it's always 1938, that any negotiation is appeasement, even any talk to Moscow is a privilege. It would actually legitimate them, which is absolutely crazy. You may like or not like the regime in Moscow. You talk to it. You're in the same for Beijing, New Delhi, and so many others. You've got to have go back to diplomacy. Otherwise, you know, we, we are closer today to the Third World War, to the apocalypse than we've ever been. We're hanging by a whisker, and yet that same insouciance of July 1914 seems to have gripped the ruling elites mm. in the political West. Uh, though one is chaired by the sort of language coming out of Beijing, New Delhi, and other places, South Africa, mm. Brazil, uh, which are saying warning signs. So the global South may save the political West and the, the, the global North from its own suicidal instincts, which is to go back to war like we did in 14 and 1939. Indeed, I mean, you, you actually used the word fatalism about what happened in 1914, the, the, the fatalism in a kind of a way of the great powers that were operating at that time, that, you know, they just mechanically moved forward because conceptually it was impossible for them to think otherwise and it, can i just come back again though to to what has happened in europe the the the, the, the price of the lost peace because this is all justified in many ways on on the basis of you know um, entrenching the supremacy of the west of the united states you quote krat Hamel, Krat Halmer, I can never pronounce his name, yeah. uh, extensively about how important it is that if we don't have, uh, you know, we don't assert the United States, we'll have chaos around the world. That's why the unipolar moment is necessary. We extend NATO eastward in the way that we do, because that's also essential for, you know, shoring up our position and shoring up the West's position, and increasing security and doing all of those things. Of course, what it's all done is it's done exactly the opposite. We've actually seen the biggest, de the fastest decline, I think, that the West has experienced in modern history, in a kind of a sense, in the last 30 years. We've seen uh, uh, powers um, emerge around the world, and those powers are, when they're not unfriendly to the West, but they are very alarmed and worried about the way it's behaving and are seeking increasingly to protect themselves from it. Now, the rise of these powers was entirely foreseeable. Uh, you know, it was foreseeable, arguably, I would say, from the time decolonization really began in the 60s. It was already obvious then that one day China, one day India, one day Indonesia would indeed become significant countries. But Instead of entrenching, consolidating an international system based on the United Nations, 
which gave the West itself. When you talked about the good West, it's important to remember that the United Nations is itself, to a great extent, a product of Western thinking and discourse. I mean, it was Western politicians, Western diplomats, which the Soviets were there too, who played the central role in shaping the United Nations at its outset. Anyway, it's over trenching that system, which would have, in fact, secured the West in a changing global environment. What we did instead is we embarked on a 30-year mission to try to keep everything, um, you know, at a kind of standstill to perpetuate forever the world of 1990. And of course, we're now in a situation where we have, instead of security in Europe, we have war in Europe, and where the rest of the world is, I can't be careful in my use of words, worried about us, about us in the West, and is organising its politics in a way that seeks to ultimately contain us, because that's what it seems to me we're starting to see. Can I just make two points in response to that? First, on the United Nations establishment, you're absolutely right that uh, you know the major impetus came uh, from obviously the United States and uh, United Kingdom at the time. But we should also say that uh, the Soviet Union played a big part in all of this uh, and that China considers itself, quite rightly, a founder member because it signed it signed up to the UN uh, declaration of, I think, January 1942, as early as that. Of course, that was the Republican China. But uh, so the United Nations really was. A, and of course, the Arab world was quite involved. Later on, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was more a project of Eleanor Roosevelt. But again, it was major discussions, debates. The Arabic world was very active in it. So that's just to say that uh, that in Broadly speaking, your point holds, but one has to say that the United Nations, a charter international system, really is a part of the patrimony of all of humanity. Uh, but the second thing in all of this, so when you began uh, just now, is that you know we can talk and talk for many hours, and then we suddenly find, hang on, we actually haven't talked about Europe qua Europe at all. And it just shows that its geopolitical and intellectual significance in global affairs is so marginal. That, you know, you talk about all this self-defeating West, but that's absolutely the case over the last 30 odd years. But the self-defeating Europe is a spectacular case of self-destruction as a ethical entity, because the European Union used to be, you know, I have used to be a great supporter of the European Union as a peace project. Look at it today. Look at what Roberto Robert Fizzo said after Macron's uh, talk about the military things. And Fizzo was such marvellous comment. And of course, Viktor Orban has been saying similar things for some time. And after the 26th of uh, February, when Macron said there could be uh, NATO forces officially, openly, in Ukraine, uh, and Fizzo said, you know, what astonished me, there wasn't the word peace at all, this martial, this military spirit um, in all of this. And, uh, you know, this is what's happened of, of the, the hijacking of the European Commission by a, an American-style militarist like Ursula von der Leyen. It is when the history books will be written, I think that the charge list against her personally and that commission of, you know, what is it, Joe Jungle Borel <laughs> uh, and so on, and, uh, and Charles Michel, you know, what a group of leaders without substantive political vision, their responsibility is peace in Europe. That's what we once used to support in the European Union. And they should be working might and main to find a way to end this dreadful war. Instead of which, they're doing absolutely everything to perpetuate it and indeed to block the possibility of the war ending. How astonishing is that? How deep is the peace lost in Europe? And how hard will it be to recuperate it and to recover some sort of peace agenda when we have, you know, the the what the, the you know that bomb from Britain, of course, the bombast, the bluster, the bellicosity with no limit. That's what's so frightening, coming also out of the Baltic Republics, 
Uh, and it sometimes even makes Poland a moderate when they say no direct forces, and which is, you know, when it comes to that, then we know we're in deep trouble. You, you mentioned a hijacking of the EU and uh, in terms of the yeah, uh, diplo diplomacy being replaced with this uh, militarism. But I was wondering if to some extent that would have been uh, not necessarily unavoidable, but the path they were on, because it seems like the format of uh, liberal hegemony would be, it's it, it creates this very uncompromising stance because it's very difficult to absorb any changes in in the international system, simply because if it's based on, if it challenges the hegemon, it undermines the existing system, or if it also is very difficult to compromise when things are framed as values in which uh, everything essentially becomes, any compromise becomes appeasement. And uh, so, th so this has become my concern, because uh, the way they speak now is, uh, they effectively suggest by, as you said, referring to Russia as the new, you know, Hitler or Nazi Germany, uh, effectively put themselves in a position where security is dependent not on finding a solution to live with Russia, but uh, effectively peace depends on defeating now the world's largest nuclear power. That's quite an absurd position to put yourself in. And even, let's say, the EU and its American partners able to achieve this goal to defeat the world's largest nuclear power without sparking a nuclear holocaust, uh, it, it wouldn't even be the end of... Uh, it wouldn't even be a return to the 90s, perpetual peace. It would be uh, effectively China has already been listed as being next on the block by the Americans uh, because they also have to be defeated somehow. It just uh, it, it doesn't seem like the yeah, liberal hegemony has this uh, flexibility to accommodate these new ch changes. Also, the inability, I guess, to uh, to bring together the world as well because uh, if you even put Russia and China aside, I think what's one thing that's really missing in the discourse now in Europe is uh, that the rest of the world isn't following us. Uh, we're all very, we, 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 we don't seem to mention that the world outside NATO is not joining in on this in any way. So, uh, you know, you, you can't dismiss it as being susceptible to Russian propaganda or not caring about democracy. It doesn't really <laughs> explain this all. So it, it's simply not discussed anymore because it becomes inconvenient. And this is, um, this is my concern now that we hear this rhetoric, especially from Biden, that you know we're going to more or less return to a new Cold War, where they suggesting all liberal democracies will unite under U.S. leadership, and we will essentially replay the Cold War again and knock out its key enemies. But uh, the Cold War had such unique features. I mean, this was the ideological divide was not liberal and authoritarian. You had uh, capitalists and the communists. So the adversaries were all communist countries. Uh, decoupled from economic statecraft which uh, and all that entails and meanwhile all the allies were willing to subordinate or not subordinate but at least uh, resolve their economic differences with the united states in order because the military confrontation had to take priority uh, i just don't see any of this being able to be replayed now you have countries like russia china very deep in economic uh, statecraft especially the chinese uh, you see the europeans at some point they will they will i can't imagine continuing on this path because what they're doing now is stripping themselves of all economic and strategic relevance so i'm just um i, I i'm not sure what 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 your views are is it uh, is there any possibility to absorb these changes in this uh, current uh well not current uh the passing liberal hegemonic system you know i am um, i mean you alluded to it that uh, about what is a cold war and it's uh, uh, and it's a big debate whether we should call where we are today a second Cold War. Uh, and uh, I initially was rather skeptical about this way of framing. You know, how do we con how do we envisage how do we frame conceptualize international politics today? Not international system. You mentioned, by the way, earlier this idea of world order. I have no idea what a world order is, so I, I don't use the term at all. But you have an international system, the charter system. Then you have within well, I do in one specific context, then within international politics, we've got world orders. We've got the US-led one. So we do have, there's not a world order, there is a US-led world order. Then we have the, uh, the well, I was going to say opposed, but a different one. So let's call it even the political West on the one side and the political East on the other. And the political East is a much different beast. 
So it's not the same as this block politics, this ideological unity, this alliance of democracies you mentioned just now or hinted at. Uh, so we have the political West consolidating and look, look at the joy today in Brussels and in London and in New Washington about how this war in Ukraine has consolidated the bloc, given NATO a purpose and so on. Un and all of that rhetoric, which, as you say, is suicidal, it's rebarbative, it's hermetic, it simply cannot take in ideas from outside of itself. Meanwhile, we have this dynamic political East, flexible, much more protein. It's not based on block politics. It's explicitly excluded. Chinese philosophy excludes block politics. It's not going to be based on that alliance system which we had before 1914 and we had in the first Cold War of the Soviet Union versus the United States. So we have this political East based on, you know, they rhetorically keep appealing to the UN Charter and they're absolutely right to do so. Of course, then people say, you know, what about their human rights and so on? You could say the same about ours uh, in a different way. I mean, the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands who have been uh, unnecessarily killed in Iraq and Syria. We still have we still have sanctions on Syria. What on earth is the purpose there to starve a tortured and destroyed civilized uh, economy and society to this day? It's vindictive, and tens of thousands are dying because of those these so-called Caesar sanctions imposed by Donald Trump and intensified by the Biden administration. So we have a political West which is irresponsible, which is uh, imposing costs on the global south, and we have an emerging political east. Very different. But its key point, its ideology, is Soviet internationalism. But then we would say, and I would say, to both the political west and the political east, yes, support the UN Charter, but also the values on which the Charter is based. And of course, Societies develop in their own pace, in their own time. Uh, but uh, so therefore, you know, but still, it's a commitment which we have to uh, to, to insist on. Well, not as, you know, a teacher, master, master pupil relationship, which is the way we tend to do these things. So we have a, a second Cold War, which is more dangerous than the first, but a very different one. It's like a game of chess. Each game of chess has, you know, works out differently. But it plays by the same rules. That is, don't go nuclear. Let the great powers not directly come into conflict with each other, because that will end. We come close to it in Ukraine, of course. But uh, so it's a much more dangerous one. So I'm, I'm saying, you know, talking about. Um, and can I go back to your first point, which is to say that there's a zero sum game. That peace depends on defeating the enemy. Indeed, that is a new element as well in the Second Cold War. It was never there in the first one. Uh, so, so, uh, but if we analyze it in this way, as we're doing, then we can begin to, you know, think about strategies or advice even to government. Because surprisingly enough, there's people in Washington. We saw all those people who were over the Palestine issue in the State Department wrote those letters, 100 or I think it's 200 people. Uh, even, even in bellicose, belligerent London, we know that in the Minister of Defense, I won't name names, in the, and so there's going to be rooting them out now, in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, elsewhere, in government, there are people who, you know, who understand these things. Uh, and uh, so therefore, you know, all is not lost. Absolutely. Can I, can I confirm that? I mean, I, there's no doubt, well, confirm that. I mean, I, can I agree with that? I know for a fact, as we all do, that there are people in Washington, in London, in Paris, in Berlin, who do not agree with the direction of the policy has been taking. And they are there, and to the extent that they can, they are speaking out, and they're not being listened to at the moment, but they're still there, and they will continue to be. And can I just perhaps pose a question, a sort of rather more optimistic point now, which is, you know, we're right in the middle of this horrible war at the moment, and it is deeply distressing, and mm -hmm. we see this extreme period of, I mean, off the scale belligerence confrontation. I agree with everything you've said about the uh, European Commission and what it's become, by the way. And by the way, I should also say, as someone who for most of his life was a strong supporter of the, you know, what eventually became today's European Union, I feel, you know, deeply, well, 
questioning of much about what I believed before and disillusioned and demoralized by what has happened. But is it possible that this is the dark moment before mm -hmm. the dawn, if I can put it like that, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I once remember reading long ago some passage, I think it was um, uh, Ibn Haldun, who said, you know, that at the very end of an empire, there is often a big show of force. <laughs> it like like you know the the wick in the cat. He said the wick in the the, the light in the wick of the cat, which brightens up at the very end, and it looks like it's getting it's about to get brighter, when in fact it's a sign that it's going out. In other words, all of this activity, this feverish activity, this attempt to militarize everything, to seek victory over Russia fast and all of that is because there's a somewhere an understanding that this is the last big throw and that it it doesn't work this period of western a kind of western hegemony very ugly western hegemony is ending and that the true point here is exactly the point that the global south the rest of the world is not joining in this you know 85% of humanity is saying this isn't something that we want to become involved in. They are asserting the charter principles, the United Nations, and they're also saying this is the, this is um, we are we are we are we are the forces. We are we are the rest of the world, and we're becoming stronger. And whereas at the start of the 20th century, the West basically was the part of the world when all the decisions were made. That is not true anymore. So that, you know, th this is the last big flash, if you like, of that 500 years of Western policy and focus on Europe. And that once we get through this, which I believe we will, by the way, in mm -hmm. spite of all the dangers, um, the world will reshape itself and it will become more stable and we'll just have to accept in Europe and in the United States that we're part of a world's commonwealth. I like that word, by the way. Uh, um, um, and that we have a good place in it if we choose to make the most of it. Absolutely. So we need to, and this is what I'm working on now, is a, you know, a vision of what this commonwealth politics could look like within international politics, within the framework of the international system. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. So that if we do get, our, get see our way through this, we should have ideas waiting at the other end of how we do it. One of them, for example, I mean, there's many of them, but one of them would have to be a going back to that uh, Gorbachevian idea, and I'm still a great Gorbachevian, like it or lump it, but, uh, you know, of the common European home, or France or Mitterrand, if you want to put it the other way, a confederation of Europe, so that all the states of Europe could live comfortably and happily in this capacious, pluralistic uh, vision from Lisbon to Vladivostok, including our friends in Central Asia and the South Caucasus, uh, and, you know, North Eurasia, a huge North Eurasian confederation. And that, as I say, from, from Lisbon to Vladivostok, uh, that would be one of those visions that we had to get away from this militarized Atlanticism, which is a leftover, a hangover from the Cold War. Uh, and of course, uh, not for a second am I saying that this should be an anti-American exercise. Absolutely not. We work in partnership with, with Washington, with all those United States, because you, as well as I know, with all of our many, many friends in the United States, um, just this morning, I was uh, uh, in the last days, I was working with people in California, Blacks' Peace International, peace movement there. And I'm doing many uh, other of those events. So we know that uh, th these ideas resonate in American society deeply, deeply. Uh, so, you know, the idea of anti-Americanism, we're anti-militarism, we're anti the political West and so on. So make it absolutely clear. So, but I, I really do hope that, you know, remember how I won't quote the author of the idea that as we get closer to socialism, uh, the class struggle intensifies. Well, that's slightly paraphrasing <laughs> your argument 
uh, that indeed. Uh, but you know, as you say, that just before a candle splutters, it sort of flares out, um, and we're in that flare stage. But um, I just hope you're right. Uh, I really do. And uh, you know, in this confederation of Europe, by the way, European Union may have its own place, but let them get on with it without its endlessly expansive ambitions. Uh, NATO may have its little corner and niche within all of that as well. Those who you know, it's obviously instead of, you know, again, it's that substitution, uh, like we saw the political West substituting for the charter international system. And so NATO has substituted for that uh, larger European security order, which never happened. I mean, it was skeletally in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. But it was never given substance. So in and the European Union, it expanded and it claimed to be, you know, Brussels centric Europe, which is impossible. Anybody looking at the map, as Glenn suggested earlier, that we have Moscow there, the world's largest country, and now Europe's largest economy, uh, which, you know, has to be brought in, but on not post Cold War terms of victory and sub mm. as a subaltern force to, to the political West, but a whole new political architecture. So, you know, I, I'm often accused by our friends in Moscow, uh, uh, you know, Fyodor Lukyanov in particular, that he always says my problem, that's Sacro's problem. Uh, he's such an innate, always an optimist. And I'm glad you joined me in that, uh, you know, without hope, where are we? Well, exactly. That's that's absolutely right. Well, uh, so we have to start to bring this to an end. Uh, I also want to, yeah, just bring uh, new listeners' attention to uh uh, Professor Sakwas, uh, working on, almost finished with uh, another book, which is The Political Culture of the Second Cold War. Uh, just something for people to look forward to. And uh, mm. I, I hope I got that title right. Anyways, uh, I really hope also, I haven't been able to <laughs> read your draft or haven't access to it, of course, but uh, I really hope you unpack this, some of these ideas of what mm. what, what the Second Cold, uh, Cold War entails. Because uh, as, as you mm. suggested, and uh, yes, yeah, so I was working towards was, well, what exactly is it? Because we don't, this idea that it's an ideological divide, it's sold in the West, but obviously no one in the East is seeing this as a conflict of ideology of, you know, liberal democracy versus authoritarianism, uh, which would be a very weird way of, uh, an overly simplified way of organizing the world. Uh, we don't have, the East is very averse to block politics, as you mentioned. So there seems to be um, a, a yeah, very different uh, rules, and uh, which begs the question if we're even playing the same game in this uh, new Cold War. So I'm really looking forward to this, and uh, and otherwise, yeah, I hope uh, also try to be optimistic that there's some new ideas coming because uh, again, this like the current format of Europe, the idea that the country in Europe with the largest territory, the most people, the largest economy the most powerful army, that they are the only one who are not allowed to be a part of Europe, It uh, that this was the recipe for stability and security. I mean, it's um, th this should have been predicted. So I'm <laughs> I'm really, yeah, I'm looking forward to your next book. That was my point. Uh, so any final comments, uh, Alexander? Uh, uh, just to say that I completely agree with the last point you've made, Glenn, but I also want to say that uh, people can also read today uh, Richard's current book, the one we've been discussing today, The Lost Peace. Um, it's, it's, it's tremendous uh, tour de force, if I can say, discussing international relations. It sweeps beyond Europe. It looks at the whole charter system. It explains a lot of the history. It explains a lot of the thinking that has happened. And it discusses what went wrong and what we both lost. And that's why I, I come back to the sadness. But also it points the way to the kind of things that we we might be able to do, the, you know, the way that we can find our way through this, this, this situation that we're in today. So the lost piece. Thank you. It's been marvellous talking with you, too. Thank you.